by poem at the inauguration. Keep breathing and listen. I'm a firm believer that often terror is trying to tell us of a force far greater than despair. In this way, I look at fear, not as cowardice, but as a call forward, a summons to fight for what we hold dear. And now more than ever, we have every right to be affected, afflicted, affronted. If you're alive, you're afraid. If you're not afraid, then you're not paying attention. The only thing we have to fear is having no fear itself, having no feeling on behalf of whom and what we've lost, whom and what we love. Even as we've grieved, we've grown, even fatigued, we've found that this hill we climb is one we must mount together. We are battered but bolder, worn but wiser. I'm not telling you not to be tired or afraid. If anything, the very fact that we're weary means we are, by definition, changed. This time will be different. Excuse me. We are brave enough to listen to and learn from our fear. This time will be different because this time we'll be different. We already are. Amanda Gorman. This is my starting point. It is within and because of our fears, within and because of our changed selves and changed places of higher education, and within this temporary space in which we're together, that we can learn together and together imagine care, justice, and community anew. And we can find it even amidst the very difficult. So let me tell you about Dorothea Dix and Anna Ott. You may have heard of Dix, but unless you've read my work, you've never heard of Anna Ott. These two white women never met, but their stories and their lives overlapped. Neither was perfect. Their stories speak to the messiness of social and power structures and the messiness of individual lives. Their stories speak to the failures of care and community and to the potentialities of care and community. In the 19th century United States, beginning first in New England and then spreading outwards, public and private groups nearly fell over one another in efforts to establish insane asylums, schools for deaf and blind people, community hospitals for those in poverty, and schools for those diagnosed as feeble-minded and idiots. Insane asylums dominated this way. Between 1840 and 1880, public asylums grew from 18 to 139. Every state in the ever expanding United States allocated land, money, and legislative attention to the creation of asylums. Though white male physicians directed these asylums, their contemporaries and today's historians generally give credit for the public fervor that enabled asylums to Dorothea Dix. Beginning with her 1843 publication, um, and it's got a long title, she needed an editor, Memorial to the Legislature of Massachusetts, protesting against the confinement of insane persons and idiots in almshouses and prisons. Dix became a widely recognized public figure. By 1845, she had traveled across the nation, visiting 18 prisons, 300 county jails, and more than 500 poor houses. She demanded improved conditions. In the two decades afterwards, her activities continued at a similar pace, generally targeting Congress and state legislators, although she also had significant impact in England, Scotland, and Ireland. Dix maintained a single issue focus on the therapeutic medical incarceration of insane whites. She believed insane white people were medically malleable. They were worthy and capable of benefiting from rehabilitation if they were contained and incarcerated. Dix, however, believed medical resources spent on curing non-whites to be a folly due to what she considered their racial inferiority. Her racist ideology permeated the theorization the planning, the funding, the building, the staffing, and the programming of insane asylums. Now in the 1850s, 
Dix devoted herself to lobbying the President, President Fillmore and the US Congress to dedicate substantial land holdings, all violently taken from indigenous nations, to fund a network of state and federal asylums. Dix and her supporters in Congress imagined formal tribal land holdings as virgin territory, rich for use as state asylums. Dix's bill would have set aside 10 million acres for the funding of insane asylums across the growing nation. The bill passed Congress, but President Pierce vetoed the bill in a long, complicated story. But despite the setback, this effort brought even greater attention to the development of asylums. Wisconsin followed the path taken by most of the new emerging Midwestern states. Following statehood in 1848, Wisconsin created a state capitol building, 1848, a university, then a prison, a better state capitol building, and then an insane asylum in 1860. Now think about this whole swath of new Midwestern states. By violent death and violent removal, they devastated tribal nations. The states then quickly embraced universities, prisons, and asylums as the markers of statehood and civilization. These institutions enabled states to educate desirable citizens, generally limited by race and gender, and detain some of the undesirable in either prisons or asylums. My point here is that from the very creation of insane asylums in the US, there's a whole pile of stuff going on. Settler colonialism, asylums assisted in the process Asylums became one of the means by which white settlers claimed permanence, erased the presence of indigenous people and remade the geography. Then there's the new professionalization of male physicians who embraced insanity by claiming it as a condition that could be cured and that needed medicalized incarceration. Asylum physicians turned to this new medic or medical theory called moral treatment in which they emphasized exercise, work, amusement, and forced labor within large-scale medicalized locked institutions. Then, as I've said, we've got racially differentiated medicine. As Salem, Dix, and many physicians argued that non-white peoples were neither civilized or developed enough for real insanity or real cure. And as you'll see, in some cases, Asylums assisted with patriarchal control. White husbands used insane asylums and the threat of them as ways to control wives and women's economic resources. Now, in the midst of this, Anna Ott moved to Madison in 1856. She arrived as both newly divorced and newly wed in that order. She arrived with money and substantial land holdings. She got these as a result of a recent divorce settlement. And she had legal control of these because of a prenup agreement with her second husband, George. She established herself as a physician, a graduate of one of the few medical colleges that allowed women entrance. Her husband, George, set up a tannery and leather goods business in one of Ott's properties, a storefront she owned on Pinckney Street. George thus paid rent to his wife for the use of both the lot and the building. Now, um, over 1858 and 1859, the couple hired an architectural firm to build a grand home. This is an image of their home. It's two stories, brick building. The firm also designed the estate capital building. So by hiring them, George and Anna made clear their desire to be part of the Madison elite. This home was situated at 21 East Wilson Street, facing the Capitol and along the shore of Lake Monona, where the hotel conference center is now. Local sources often referred to Anna as, quote, Mrs. Dr. Ott. And there's evidence that she had an active medical practice as one of only two college trained physicians in the United States, or in, excuse me, in Wisconsin. The other was in Madison. This was not an easy time to be a female professional. And I wanna provide some context here. When Dr. Laura Wolcott opened her medical practice in Milwaukee in 1856, her local male colleagues 
actually published a false obituary of her in hopes that she would leave town. In 1868, they rejected her for membership in the Medical Society of Milwaukee County, insisting that, quote, the society cannot survive the presence of a woman. Madison physicians did not form a medical society until decades later, so could not exclude Anna. But undoubtedly, her male colleagues were no more happy to see her than were Wolcott's in Milwaukee. Similarly, when Lavinia Goodell sought admittance to the Wisconsin bar in 1875 so that she could practice law, the chief justice of the Wisconsin State Supreme Court resoundingly denied her application. He said, the law of nature destines and qualifies the female sex for the bearing and nurture of the children of our race and for the custody of the homes of the world and their maintenance in love and honor. Women who entered professions such as law and presumably medicine, he wrote, quote, are departures from the order of nature and when voluntary treason against it. The same debate was happening in higher education. Nationally, Harvard medical professor Edward Clark published the now infamous but then very widely popular Sex in Education in 1873. Armed with medical certainty, Clark warned that women who engaged in the sustained mental activity of higher education risked sterility, masculinization, insanity, and even death. In Wisconsin, state legislators couldn't decide whether or not to admit women to the newly opened University of Wisconsin. In 1863, the university began to admit women, but then changed its mind in 1867. These actions cloaked sexism as benevolent and healthful caretaking. Well, despite the sexism, Anna made money. The most substantive evidence of the details of her medical practice are in some receipts. There's a $15 and three cent receipt for medical purchases made from a local druggist. At that time, she purchased a variety of medicines, a surgeon's needle, some ether, which was an anesthetic, adhesive plasters, indicating she did surgery. She also earned money from financial and land investments. Her ongoing property purchases provided rental income. She owned large acreages throughout the Midwest and lent out cash at standard interest rates. So again, let's think about these large structures. Anna benefited from and contributed to the process of settler colonialism. She did so as an investor, a resident, a builder of the city of Madison, and as someone who made it easier for other white settlers to arrive and to stay. Anna also benefited from the professionalization of medicine. Her position as a physician conferred money and status upon her. But this was complicated, of course. As a female physician and one with money and land holdings, Anna encountered skepticism, mistrust, and plain old misogyny and sexism. Then the story gets even more complicated. And please note that I'll be talking some about domestic violence and I want you to do what you need to do to care for yourself. In January, 1859, about two and a half years after Anna and George married, Anna filed divorce papers against her second husband, George. The remaining historical evidence about the marriage reflects much of what we know about intimate partner violence. As you'll see, Anna filed twice, once in January, 1859. She then withdrew a year later. She filed again for divorce in 1868 and withdrew that in December, 1870. In all of these cases, significant violence occurred. George locked Anna out of the room or excuse me, out of the house, at least once in the middle of a snowstorm, or locked away the food and blankets, and Anna sheltered with neighbors or at a local boarding house. George begged her to return, he made promises, Anna returned, and the cycle happened all over again, and again, and again. Anna alleged that George beat her, and George alleged that it was all in self-defense against Anna's unreasonable and unpredictable behaviors. Anna alleged that George stole her money and refused to pay her the rent he owed. George alleged Anna to be selfish and greedy, but denied none of her monetary allegations. In this period, settler women in similar situations often turned to male family members for protection. 
but Anna had no family nearby. She then turned to neighbors. Historian Robin Sanger has shown that white Wisconsin community members regularly sheltered neighboring women facing household violence throughout the 1840s, 50s, and 60s. She also argues that marital violence in Wisconsin was quote, elevated and ferocious compared to regions in which settler colonialism was more firmly established. She explains, it appears as if white Wisconsin men took their cues from the violence that they witnessed in their communities and perpetrated physical marital cruelties as part of a quest to reinforce their authority as the head of a household. The violence committed by white colonists against indigenous communities became normalized and leaked into settler households and relationships. Patriarchy and settler colonialism blended and strengthened one another. Now, during the second divorce proceeding, George introduced allegations of Anna's insanity and unwomanliness, tying ableism and patriarchy together. And this is where I will read a little bit of um, violence. So, George's deposition stated that Anna was, quote, an unwomanly, large, masculine, muscular woman, a violent and uncontrollable temper, and subject to strange and unaccountable freaks, at times almost amounting to insanity. He noted one incident in which Anna had, quote, kicked over and struggled in the most unwomanly manner until she was overpowered. He complained that contrary to the propriety of her sex, she had, quote, frequently come to the store and spent much time there, espousing authority and interfering within the store, interfering with him and his business. She told him what to do, clearly. In his version, when he had taken, quote, occasion in a friendly way to tell her that she ought not to be there interfering in the store, his store, Anna, quote, flew into a rage. She seized a pole and went to smashing the glass partition between the front and back of the store. She struck at George with, quote, both hands full of some bridle bits, but he pushed them back and held her fists for a while, held her for some time and tried to reason with her and induce her to become herself. After George let her go, she jumped up and about, accusing him of murdering his first wife, burning his tannery and everything else she could think of, and then threw a dish of dirty water over him. Accusations of unwomanliness, particularly for a woman of Anna's class, had legal power. Historian Leslie Harris argues that at this time, if a woman failed to behave properly in cases of marital violence, quote, she became unsexed and the violence was justifiable. In 1856, one Wisconsin court ruled that a woman's conduct was quote, most wanton, most wicked and most disgraceful. And thus her husband's violence was legally justified. The wanton, wicked, disgraceful behavior is that this woman cut her hair short, she dressed in men's clothing and she took a boat from Milwaukee to Cleveland. Anna's class and educational status meant that others expected her to behave within relatively inflexible and specific womanly parameters. Serving as a physician might be tolerated, but responding physically to her husband's assault was not. In this second divorce attempt, the judge sided with Anna. He ordered that George pay all legal fees and provide a living monthly allowance. George had to allow Anna access to the house and to her medical tools. George must, the judge insisted, quote, postpone selling his wife's personal property and, quote, refrain from interfering with her personal liberty. In other words, George could not profit by selling Anna's material goods and he could not lock her up. Then Anna once again dropped the divorce suit. So again, let's step back and think about social structures, settler colonialism. Anna benefited from and added to the process. Patriarchy also embraced and used the violence of settler colonialism. And while I do not intend to blame George's violence solely on settler colonialism, settler colonialism provided additional justification for patriarchal violence, normalizing it. And then in the midst of all of this, George and Anna continued to live together. Their neighbors continued likely to overhear violence, provide shelter, 
There was gossip. Then Anna attempted to vote. During the 1872 presidential election, women across the nation, including Susan B. Anthony, claimed their right to vote by simply attempting to do so. Anna did so at the third ward's polling station, using the argument that as a tax paying citizen, she should be able to vote. Uh, didn't happen. Anna left no record of her details, but another Madison woman did. According to her, the election supervisor quote, looked daggers at her as she entered quote, into the presence of the board of supervisors and heavy fumes of smoke. The board supervisor pontificated on the rights of male citizens and rejected her vote. The woman left, she wrote, looking forward to the day when the town brain, excuse me, the town board had brains unaffected by quote, tobacco smoke and lager beer. Ott sought this political agency despite hostility and her vulnerabilities. She sought to shape her own life and to have an impact by whatever means she could. Six months later, in May of 1873, George and several local physicians institutionalized Anna as insane at the Wisconsin State Hospital for the Insane. Anna became patient number 1,763. Medical experts determined her to be insane and legal experts determined her to be legally incompetent. This combination of legal and medical authority kept Anna at the asylum until her death in 1893, 20 years. The Wisconsin State Hospital for the Insane reflected national trends. The superintendent and his staff had responsibility for maintaining the buildings and 105 acres of grounds and for enacting the moral cure. This image is from an 1870s report um, and is an etching of the museum. It is black and white, um, looks very peaceful, very few people. It is four stories high and very, very large. The main building contained kitchens, storerooms, reception rooms, visiting rooms, offices, dining rooms, and a large chapel. The wings were sex segregated. The Wisconsin State Hospital for the Insane became and remained woven into the community's institutions. It reinforced settler colonialism and literally walled in whites deemed incapable of relating with family or friends appropriately, deemed incapable of productively laboring. The institutional walls became both literal and metaphorical building blocks for patriarchy and ableism and were used by the state as proof of its benevolence. When the physician who admitted Anna to the institution in 1873 did so, he diagnosed her to have a diseased brain, specifically, quote, chronic mania with frequent exacerbations. Asylum physicians developed their diagnoses at this time based on medical manuals, the advice of other physicians, and prior experiences. And they were taught that they could discern insanity by looking at their patients. One widely used text described mania as, quote, an excessive an expansion, expansive activity of the mind that often included violent and extreme action. According to this author, Mannix directed their out energy outward and think about this alliteration, exaltation, exhilaration, extravagance, exaltation, expansion, exaggeration, and explosion. In another widely used guidebook for physicians, the author noted that brain diseases had well-marked bodily symptoms. He warned that while all asylum inmates possessed repulsiveness, this was especially the case in the female. Insanity, he argued, caused women to, quote, rapidly lose their good looks and plainness or downright homeliness is the rule. He also included images. The image you see is of a black and white um, 
pencil etching of a woman in relatively plain clothing, her hair tied in a bun, looking downward. This author, Dr. Alan Hamilton, said that the suspicious violent nature of the manic was embodied on her by an averted head and sinister expression, a contracted brow, and quote, deep and sharply drawn lines around her mouth. He wrote that the chronic manic female would usually look downward, but would sharply draw up her head when meeting others and begin swearing, cursing, and shaking her fist. She would wear a scowl, a contemptuous sneer, or a malicious grin. Hamilton also warned about delusions, obscenities, coarse hair, and quote, carnal illusions. This is what the doctor would have looked for as he diagnosed Anna. Particularly notable in Anna's case file are words of assessment and characterization. It's clear that conflict existed between Anna and the asylum staff and possibly between Anna and other inmates. When her behaviors pleased them, staff called her pleasant and ladylike. When Anna displeased staff, she was officious, fault-finding, exacting, imperious, tyrannical, treacherous, the list goes on, abusive, wily, troublesome. It's like they had a thesaurus. Asylum physicians focused great concern and attention on what they called Anna's delusions. The admission records detailed her, quote, prominent delusion to be a belief in, quote, a conspiracy afoot to defraud her of her property. They also noted her delusion that others tried to, quote, imprison her falsely, deprive her of her liberty. Once Anna complained that others had broken into her trunk, stealing her clothing, another delusion, the physicians said. Now let's think about this. Anna alleged that others tried to steal her money and imprison her. This diagnosed delusion included a great deal of reality. Due to the legal determination of incompetency, she had lost control of her money. Due to the diagnosis of insanity, she was contained in an insane asylum. It's also not implausible that others stole her clothing. For her clothing was likely of a better quality than most staff or inmates could afford. The pathologizing of Anna's words, however, as delusions meant that whatever she said could not be truthful and that her reported or purported untruthfulness legitimized the diagnosis. And perhaps a pre-apology, I have cats around my feet. So um, if you see them, that's what's going on. In 1881, the Wisconsin State Legislature added insanity to the state's limited grounds for divorce, and George turned around and sued Anna for divorce, after twice resisting her efforts to divorce him. During these proceedings, three physicians testified to the incurability of Anna's insanity. One provided details about her life pre-institutionalization. Quote, she was very vivacious and talkative and with a great desire to manage her own business and claimed to be and practiced and advertised as a female physician. She practiced a great deal. He went on, she carried a pistol and said that if she was interfered with, she would shoot the first man that laid his hands on her. This is actually the only mention I've found of a pistol. In this case, Anna's class, her medical expertise, her ambition, and her pistol were used against her as part of the pathologization process. This physician used unconventional womanhood to add weight to his diagnosis, establish Anna as a threat to men, and justify both institutionalization and divorce. When asked if George had contributed to Anna's insanity, one physician testified, quote, she complained that her husband had abused her, but she never admitted that she was insane and so never claimed that her husband made her so. In other words, one could not blame George for contributing to Anna's insanity because Anna would not admit she was insane. 
Multiple others testified regarding George's lack of responsibility. The Madison police chief characterized interactions between the couple as, quote, hair pulling scrapes and a general family rumpus, testifying that he had never seen evidence of violence. So apparently, hair pulling scrapes and rumpuses are not violence. George swore, quote, I never did her any violence except in restraining her and then did her no unnecessary violence. The result, the Dane County Court um, dissolved the marriage of George and Anna Ott on the basis of Anna's insanity, agreeing that George had no responsibility. This is discouraging to me. Well, early evidence indicates that community knowledge of the violence of the household was widespread. By this 1881 divorce, Anna's diagnosis of insanity had erased that knowledge and blamed her for any lingering stories. The household violence facilitated the insanity diagnosis, and then the insanity diagnosis erased or at least blurred the household violence. Anna Ott died in 1893 after 20 years in the Wisconsin State Hospital for the Insane, isolated from family and friends and generally erased. This image is of her um, grave marker. It's very small, about a foot wide, six inches high um, in the middle of a grass at the cemetery in Madison. There are flowers by this. It says Mrs. Anna B. Ott, um, the dates at rest. Death was a routine part of 19th century institutional life. Anna was one of 39 who died at the state hospital in 1893. The next year, 51 inmates died, a record. Anna's grave marker conveys the date of her death, but nothing else. How she died, if anyone mourned her, her thoughts and actions during her last days. I don't know if her daughter Aurelia knew of her mother's death before the burial, or if the daughter ever visited, the grave marker is unadorned and uninformative. Death, however, did not end Anna's story. Over a month after her death, or excuse me, over a year after her death, she hit the national news. Anna, unnamed asylum employees claimed, had issued a dramatic deathbed confession to an unsolved 1857 robbery of the local Wells Fargo office. According to the reported confession, she had robbed an employee of his key after delivering his wife of a baby. She snuck into the office and emptied the safe of $8,000. Anna's diagnosis of insanity here became its own overwhelming story, retroactively recasting everything in her life the story of the robbery is tantalizing, but unlikely. Anna had numerous strokes in the years before she died and spent nearly the last decade in bed. The resulting paralysis and her confinement to bed raises significant questions about her ability to make such a confession. But her diagnosis told a story that was more encompassing, more convenient than logical. In this version of her life, not only was her professional standing and financial skills erased, but they became fruits of her insanity. But then even get, again, the story's not over. We're back to the picture of Anna and George's home. A 1930s book of Madison's beautiful homes included the former Ott home, built in 1860, and noted one unique element. Supposedly each room had two doorways, even the wine cellar. The reason given was that George Ott had feared the violence of his insane wife, Anna, and thus insisted that the architect include two doors in every room so that George could escape from his crazy wife. Now in my reading of the evidence, Anna's neighbors, the local aldermen, and even the courts initially believed her allegations of George's violence. However, between her last attempt to divorce George and our coffee table book, George had divorced her 
she had spent 20 years in an insane asylum and had appeared in newspapers as a bank robber. She had become an entertaining town lunatic of community memory. Once again, the diagnosis physicians bestowed on her and the decades of institutionalization rewrote Anna's story. This is shifting terrain. Now you're all overwhelmed and depressed, and that is not my goal. The past, however, remains with us. The past can feel very heavy, very oppressive. And your conference organizers asked me to speak on imagining care, justice, and community. So what in the world am I doing? Into this narrative, I'd like to insert some care and community, and we can think about justice. This is an image of a, um, of a receipt. During her years at institutionalization, uh, institutionalization, Anna spent money. In the 1870s, she purchased a washstand, a dressing bureau, the high back cane rocker that is included here in this receipt, and a bamboo chair. She subscribed to the local newspaper. She had boat rides on Lake Mendota. She received her own tableware, including china and tea sets. She had perfume, soap, hairbrushes, hosiery, and handkerchiefs delivered. This next receipt is for clothing. Clothing and food constituted the majority of Anna's spending up until the time of her stroke, at which time her spending ended. Seam sisters regularly visit her in the asylum to create new clothing. In April of 1874, a local seamstress made her a dress of black silk with trimmings in addition to socks and shoes. Another seamstress submitted a bill for four and a half days of labor, part of them with Anna at the asylum to construct and fit several dresses. Then there is the food, there are two receipts. This is largely fresh fruit, but also canned fruit during the months it was out of season in, Mass in Wisconsin. One bill included six cases of pears, 35 cans in each case, six cases of peaches, two cases of grapes, and two cases of plums. Similarly, another bill charged for three cans of peaches, pears and apricots, cans of grapes, gumdrops and egg plums, a dozen oranges, half a dozen lemons, and two dozen dates. Now think about this. George had successfully had Anna declared legally incompetent. This meant that she had the legal standing of a child and was assigned a legal guardian. Anna had made clear she did not want George as her legal guardian and the judge agreed. He assigned William Treadway, a local leader with a reputation for honesty and good financial management to be her guardian. Treadway is interesting to me because he never exercised control over Anna's spending. He simply signed approval and paid the bills. So what does all that mean? On a practical and immediate level, my analysis is that the court assigned Treadway as a way of hedging their bets. The court and community remained generally suspicious of Anna and her behaviors, but they did not want to reward George and they did not want to overpunish Anna. Treadway simply paid the bills. I don't want to overcredit Treadway and the court that appointed him, but I want to put some threads of hope, care, and community, threads of resistance. And there's more than one thread. In the asylum, I think we can think about expenditures as resistance. Anna shaped her own life via spending. And I think she created community via spending. Anna was a shrewd businesswoman who'd left her first marriage with significant funds. She invested those funds wisely and likely held a greater net worth than all asylum staff combined. In an asylum where her power was so constricted, clothing, furniture, food, and other material goods signified self-assertion. Then there are all those cans of fruits and vegetables. How many canned peaches can one human being eat? We know asylums were places of theft, both by inmates and staff members. And some of Anna's goods likely found their way into other people's pockets. Treadway, however, was a formidable man 
And I don't think he would have let large scale theft happen. Anna may have used fruits and vegetables as a form of currency within the institution, bartering them for books, company, or time alone. She may have shared some of those cans of peaches. One physician claimed or complained at the time of her 1881 divorce that her guardian allowed her to have, quote, everything that was suitable and even more than was necessary for her comfort, end quote. This clearly made him angry. Then there is my favorite thread. In March, 1880, the same month that Anna had fruit cologne and a new dress, local druggists delivered a thermometer to the asylum. This came from a druggist and thus was likely a medical thermometer and physicians used thermometers in this time period. Given Anna's history as a physician, she could have been practicing medicine while a diagnosed mad woman inside the asylum. Hospital superintendents frequently complained about her quote, impudent and fault-finding nature. Perhaps she disapproved of the hospital and medical care and took it upon herself to serve as a clinician, doctoring her fellow psych inmates and annoying asylum staff. Perhaps she bartered her skills to acquire privileges and freedoms or to avoid violence. The only evidence remaining is the receipt for a thermometer, but it is the receipt from the druggist from which Anna regularly purchased supplies prior to her institutionalization. So these threads exist of Anna's ability to spend money on luxuries and pleasantries, despite a legal status that should have rendered that impossible. And all those cans of fruit and a medical thermometer. For me, these are the echoes, the shadows of a community of asylum inmates who, in whatever ways they could, exercised agency and care for themselves and for others. These small but tantalizing threads indicate that in addition to the heavy burdens of unjust historical structures, we also carry with us the realities of hope and community even if we do not know it. Seeds of hope, evidence of community may be small, but they generate responsibility for us to tend them and carry them forward. This is an image of a scale, two sides, like a scale of justice. On one side of the scale, we have settler colonialism, ableism, patriarchy, violence, medicalized incarceration, the law, and lots of sadness and heavy burdens. On the other side, I have cans of fruit, a medical thermometer, and lots of spending. Logic tells us which way the scale will go. This week, I called a longtime mentor for reassurance. It was one of those weeks. And she quoted Antonio Gramsci to me. I never, ever know what to expect from this woman. The words are appropriate here. Quote, I'm a pessimist because of intelligence, but an optimist because of will. My mentor willed me to have will. And let's go back to Amanda Gorman. Even as we've grieved, we've grown, even fatigued, we found that this hill we climb is one we must mount together. We are battered, but bolder, worn, but wiser. If anything, the very fact that we're weary means we are, by definition, changed. We are brave enough to listen to and learn from our fear. This time will be different because this time we'll be different. We already are. I'm also gonna rely twice on Audre Lorde. In poetry is not a luxury, she wrote. The white fathers told us, I think, therefore I am. And the black mothers in each of us, the poet, whispers in our dreams, I feel. Therefore, I can be free. Lord prods me on. Let our feelings, quote, and the honest exploration of them become sanctuaries and fortresses and spawning grounds for the conceptualization most radical and daring of ideas, the conceptualization of meaningful action. In the master's tools, we'll never dismantle the master's house. Lord wrote, survival is not an academic skill. Thus, while well, logic tells us which way the scale will go, the logic of the scale is never how change happens. The logic of the scale has never been how change happens. 
the logic of the scale is not how we create community and change. The logic of the scale is just plain old historically inaccurate. Change happens first in the small things, the sharing of canned peaches, the enjoyment of peaches, the insistence even to ourselves that we matter and doing whatever we can, no matter how small, to forge community. Disability justice, deep love, care for one another, community. These are all vague terms. The actions on which they are built, however, are not vague. The actions are the whispers, as Lord wrote in our dreams. They are the ridiculous purchases of furniture, canned peaches, and medical thermometers amidst awful conditions. What I love about being a historian, a scholarship of disability, is that everywhere I look in the past, there are canned peaches and medical thermometers. The past is like the present. Bold, inclusive movements of disability justice exist alongside ableism, meanness, and exclusion. Daily acts of justice and love is exist alongside selfishness and fear. The two realities of despair and hope, community and exclusion, access and barriers exist simultaneously in all of our lives. Lately, the words of disability activist Mia Mingus, M-I-A, M-I-N-G-U-S, calm me in the midst of these drooling realities, in the midst of my confusion and sometimes discouragement. Her reminder is what I should leave behind, what I wish to leave behind, reassures me. It is, quote, evidence of the wholeness we never felt and the immense sense of fullness we gave to one another. I'm not putting forward either Dix or Ott as feminists to be emulated. I wanna use them to illustrate the complex and interwoven nature of historical power structures, but also to insist that within seemingly undentable historical power structures, plenty of dents existed, even if at first glance, they are hard to discern. Ott left evidence of the wholeness she never felt and of the wholeness she desired to feel. Let us not undermine ourselves. When we ignore the seeds of hope, the whispers of our foremothers in our past, no matter how overwhelming those pasts can be, we do wrong. Imagining care, justice, and community anew requires that we recognize it in the past, even just in threads and echoes. The threads and echoes persistently remain, and we remain. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing this. Thank you so much, Kim, for that amazing talk and um, the really deeply local history. So I am in Madison right now, and um, I can see the Ott House. Like, it's still there, right? On no, it's been torn down. It's where the um, hotel and the conference center are. OK, yeah, there's just a lot of architecture in Madison that mimics that residence. And it's really interesting to think about all of these iconic structures and how they were developing simultaneously and how it impacts these frameworks that we're thinking about. Um, I, um, I also wanted to thank you for just weaving these threads of hope, community, and care throughout your talk and um, doing the work to kind of show us the, the wholeness in all of this, despite it being a history that at first glance um, seems kind of hard to get through. Um, I want to offer everybody in the audience a chance to use the Q&A box um, or the chat to ask any questions. Um, but one thing um, that came up as I was listening in, I was hoping you could make transparent for us um, as a historian, what kind of frameworks do you look at or do you use when you're going through an archive and you see cans of peaches and you see a thermometer to do this kind of archival work and read against the grain to offer this alternative history that if maybe I didn't have these trainings, I would just be like, oh, you know, that's that's a bizarre purchase or just thinking nothing of it. And um, kind of in conjunction, I was hoping um, that you could talk a little bit about your archive. And um, you offered a really a lot of beautiful archival documents and where you were able to locate them. And if there were any holes where you couldn't find Anna when you were doing your research. Um, 
the book Money, Mar Money, Marriage and Madness about Ott actually just began as a paragraph in a different book that never happened. Um, and I kept, because she was so fascinating to me, right? Digging and digging and digging and eventually created the book. However, I have nothing in her words or voice, nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that certainly was difficult. Um, she lived the first half of her life actually very close to where I am now in Ohio, in Chillicothe. Um, and because she was an unknown figure, you know, she's, she's not, she's somebody no one had ever heard of. I found her by accident. Um, but I used a lot of legal records. Um, I used obviously the guardianship records, which is piles and piles of receipts. Um, I use some, obviously the divorce records, um, her medical record, um, other indications and materials about the Mendota Asylum, information about her life prior to even moving to Madison. Um, but it is difficult, um, one, to not have anything in her voice, and then two, I'd never used like right, fruit receipts as historical evidence before. Um, so it required a lot of slow going and creativity and thinking about, in essence, trying to put myself in that context, right? If I were in the Mendoza asylum for 20 years, what would it mean to me to have a trust maker come in? Um, fruit arrive. Um, trying to think really seriously about what this meant in her daily life. So, yeah, and I, so I looked at materials. Um, there's a lot of materials in Madison at the Historical Society. Medical records are difficult to access. Um, I could access hers because I had a specific goal. Um, historians can't go digging around in medical records. Like I couldn't just randomly look at them. I could only get hers. Um, but I looked at evidence about the asylum. Um, obviously I went to the cemetery and that was meaningful to me. Um, and just you do your best. I think, you know, I always say being a historian is a combination of being a detective and a gossip columnist, and you just do your best. Right. Um, yeah, I really appreciated um, just the kind of the way that you framed it in finding these different pieces in the archive. And I was wondering about the general documents that were available for the Wisconsin State Hospital of the Insane. And um, were you able to parse together like what the, the demographics were of the people who were living with Anna and that she was interacting with during this time? Yes, um, the hospital as a state institution actually issued a yearly report of, with a lot of demographic data and um, diagnostic data. It was all you know, anonymous, it wasn't person by person, but they love to create statistical data and it's there in every year. Mm -hmm. So um, another question that came up um, is just a question more about the field of disability studies. So you did a really nice job of showing these overlapping structures of settler colonialism, of patriarchy, of ableism. And I think a lot of times we kind of see these separate um, when we're learning about them. And as somebody who's been in the field of disability studies for a while and has written about it, can you just talk about how you've seen disability studies change and grow over the last decade? And then also its place and its influence on other fields and how that's shifted? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, when the field is one I enjoy immensely. I think it's so much fun. Um, I think it's changed a lot in the last year, 10 years, maybe 20 years, right, as all fields, but really pushed by scholars and activists, um, younger scholars, scholars from all over. Um, it, it's really been pushed to think intersectionally, and I'm, we need a better term. I think the term has become almost meaningless, but, um, I, you know, I think it's big. People with disabilities, of course, have multiple identities as all of us have multiple identities. And the field is really pushing to think in really profound ways and about the varieties of experiences that people with disabilities have. I don't think the field always succeeds in doing that and certainly nor do I always succeed in doing that, but it is something that the field is working really hard at doing. Yeah, thank you. I just, you know, I've been thinking about all of the other conversations that I've been a part of and we've all been a part of about land acknowledgement and the history of our institutions. And it was just really striking for me um, to think about the history of, you know, the markers of statehood and how you get a university, you get a state capital and a sane asylum 
and in a prison in a prison and you're good to go yeah. and just how those overlapping histories like the last session i was in was about the creep of the carceral state and how mm -hmm. they're all this this deeper historical genealogy shows kind of the overlapping roots so i really appreciated those frameworks those were actually my questions and um you know I, people may know that i'm a historian too so those um where those were coming from we have some um other questions that have come in while you and i have been talking and we have an anonymous question um and somebody wanted to just ask kind of a, a general resource question so they write i am interested to read more about his the history of disability in the u.s do you know any other resources on that apart from your book, Disability History of the US, that you would recommend? Yeah, there's um, just an exploding amount of literature in US disability history. And, um, you know, it's stunning to me that 10, 15 years ago, I could name everybody on one hand just about, and, and now, you know, it's, it's everywhere. Um, what do I like? Susan Birch has a brand new book called Committed that is absolutely fabulous. Um, both Jennifer Barkley and Stephanie Hunt Kennedy. Um, let's see here. Can I put this in a chat even? Um, have new books on, on different parts of slavery and disability. Um, I think there's a lot of cultural historians working in disability. Um, there's really just marvelous work. I'd urge folks to look at disability studies quarterly. Um, to get a really good sampling of what's going on in the field as a whole, not just history, but disability studies and their book reviews. That'll give you a good idea. Um, all of the books in the disability history series that I co-edit from the University of Illinois Press are just fantastic and show you a good array. Um, I think that the field um, is fun because it really defines disability widely and does not insist on agreement about what that is. Um, we do need, I think, more about non-US disability history, mm -hmm. um, particularly non-Western disability history, um, but it's growing a lot and it's, it's really fun. Great, well, thank you um, for those resources and Carla Strand, um, who's a librarian, put some of those in the chat. Um, and we're, we're actually planning on releasing um, a blog post with um, to kind of keep the conversation going with different resources um, and books that have come up in the conference so people can expect to see that. Um, so we have, I think it's a two part question here from Samantha. And Samantha writes, going back to the types of diagnoses in categories of mental illness or disorders in your research, and how they were impacted by sexism, ableism, patriarchy, and colonialism. Do you see these discourses perpetuated in our medical system in diagnosis and treatment of mental illness or anything else today? Yes, big yes, capital letters, yes. Um, you know, my understanding of the research is that certainly diagnoses are very racially differentiated in the US today. They are differentiated by class often. Um, you know, women and men tend to, in all varieties of historical periods, receive different diagnoses, particularly for psych diagnoses. Um, you know, that, that continues. And, you know, we still hear stories of women's experiences being dismissed as irrelevant and um, that women are incapable of knowing their bodily and psych experiences. Um, so I definitely think that continues through today. Um, if some of you may know, um, gosh, I, this is like being on Jeopardy and I always have these fears. Um, the big star tennis player um, just wrote an essay in either the Washington Post or New York Times about her experiences giving birth and nearly dying when the physicians did not listen to her. Um, Serena Williams. I am so not, I'm sorry, a tennis player. Um, you know, but she wrote a beautiful essay about the horrible conditions in which doctors just didn't listen to her and she nearly died giving birth. Um, so I think these things definitely continue. Yeah, and I think, again, having these overlapping histories that are really looking at the how ableism is impacted by um, all of these other structures um, is super helpful to parsing that out. Um, another question that came up um, is, do you have any insights into the roles women played in asylum settings and specifically thinking about nurses, et cetera? And, you know, if Anna was being a doctor in some capacity, like where else were we seeing women moving in and out of these spaces? Yeah. 
Women served as attendants, um, although largely in the women's wings. Um, women also labored at the asylum, um, helping with food, um, supervising the sewing. Um, asylum residents did vast majority of the work, but um, people from outside in the community were always hired to supervise. So there were certainly women there. Um, and women, both men and women in the asylum were, as I said, did compulsory labor and were assigned to do labor according to what physicians considered appropriate for their race, class, and gender. Um, for Anna Ott, this meant she had no labor, <laughs> but for most women, this meant they either um, served in the laundry or served in the kitchen. Some of them served gardening. There were large um, acreages of farms, processes. Um, but so women were there in all of those processes. Um, I think there's also cases in which female family members wrote to asylum superintendents. So they were there as family members, asking about their loved ones, sometimes sending food, clothing. I found examples of women at um, the Mendota Asylum who were institutionalized, but actually not only did they do labor while there, they then also did their families sewing and sent it home. Um, you know, so I think women were always there um, it's not until well into the 20th century that other women were there as physicians, but women were definitely there as attendants. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you for um, kind of helping us to imagine more what that space looked like in terms of who, who um, Anna was interacting with. And um, another question um, that just came in is, have you encountered anything in your research or somewhere else surrounding the history of medical, medicalization of neurodivergence or the pathologization or incarceration of neurodivergent folks, how does this continue today? I'm just making notes. Um, that wasn't, so in Anna's time period and in others, that wasn't a diagnosis, but I think we can assume that neuro, today people we would identify as neurodivergent or who claim that identity were present in those asylums. Um, and considered deviant in one way or another. So I think we can definitely assume they were there. Um, these diagnoses that change over time are always so fascinating to me. Um, you know, make it, but certainly um, they are there. There are a few historians. Um, I can send this article to Stephanie. I'm not gonna be able to pull the citation out of my head, but there's a wonderful essay um, about a man presumably neurodivergent in the early 1700s. Um, and you know, so pe people we might define as neurodivergent were certainly present in history. And this is not a new way of being. Um, you know, and I am not an expert on today, but I think we can definitely assume that lots of folks who are neurodivergent, um, we know that they experience greater levels of violence greater levels of family exclusion, and that that places them at great vulnerability to undesired hospitalization. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a comment that I'm going to read and then a closing question. Um, so the comment is, um, from a former UW-Green Bay student, Dr. Nielsen, thank you for your wonderful presentation today. Made me feel like I was back in your classroom. And I just thought that mm -hmm. was a comment to add um, because you've been part of our collegial network really locally before. Um, so thank you. And um, so the last question um, I'm going to ask is in rural Wisconsin and outside of major cities, it's virtually impossible to have ready access to mental health resources as with regular healthcare access since so few health providers live and practice outside of cities or in college campuses, also not enough for students. So I guess that was more of another comment. Um, yeah. And that is really hard, isn't it? And Wisconsin is not alone in that. Um, I think that that is the way across the nation. And my understanding about wait times right now for psych support is just awful across the United States. Um, that is something we as a nation really need to, to wrestle with. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Um, and thank you again for um, weaving different themes and threads that we've been discussing as a community for the last two days. 
Um, I want to thank everybody in the audience for joining us, and we'll put a link in the chat for our schedule. We have one more day of events tomorrow. Um, we typically, for this conference, reserve Saturday for a lot of um, our partnerships with community groups. Um, so the African American Health Network is one of our presentations tomorrow. Um, we have um, Dr. Ada Chen joining us for a performance, and then um, we have a closing artist collaborative roundtable. Um, where um, we have local artists um, who will be talking about artists, feminist and collaborative strategies um, as part of these deeper um, frameworks of resistance and imagining new futures that we've been discussing. So um, thank you to everybody who is joining us. We also have concurrent sessions tomorrow in some of our standalone events. So please join us. And thank you again um, for, to Dr. Kim Nielsen um, for joining us today and sharing your research. And um, I really appreciated the conversation in your time and all of the, the thoughtfulness and care that you put into talking with us today. Thank you, all of you. It's lovely to be here. All right. Bye everyone, thank you.